Great. So we are going to carry on our series today in the book of Acts that we've been in for a couple of months now. Uh, but just to let you know, we are in the kind of the second part of that series, which is good news if you're waiting for it to wrap up. We're kind of in the back half of that already. Uh, so the first half was really about how the church uh, came together, gathered together, and was established. So after Jesus ascended back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit, uh, the New Testament church was established. And this second part, the bit that we're in now, is about that church having been a blessing to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. It's now going out to the ends of the earth. And did you know, it made it all the way to Australia, which is part of the reason why we are all here today. We are the ends of the earth, and uh, this gospel made it all the way to us. Last week, Jamie preached about two guys and two visions, and uh, today's story is remarkably similar to that, actually. We've got two guys, uh, and they, have, they both have a vision. Uh, and last week, like we saw, God used the visions that he gave to both Paul and Ananias to connect them. So to today, uh, God is going to use two visions he's going to give to the apostle Peter and also to a, uh, a centurion by the name of Cornelius to connect them as well. And, and there's a great encouragement for them when these two guys connect, but actually it, it's part of a far bigger story. It's great for these guys, but uh, God used what happened in their life to make the gospel go to the ends of the earth of which we are the recipients as well. So there's far bigger impact than what just happens in this story. So I'm going to sum up the story today uh, by calling it Three Scenes, Two Dreams. There's three scenes we'll be looking at and two dreams feature within them. So we're just going to walk through the passage, pause every now and then, look at what God's saying to us and uh, respond to it. So scene one opens in chapter 10, verse 1. It's going to come up on the screen behind me. And it says this, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those who are in need and prayed to God regularly. He sounds like a pretty good guy, doesn't he? One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared back at him in fear and said, well, what is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a, name, a man who's named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, that would be confusing, uh, whose house is by the sea. And that's the end of scene one, close scene. So two quick things to notice here before we go on is this, that Cornelius is a centurion. He's a senior member of the Roman army. That means he's a Gentile. He's not one of the people of God. So he's, he's not a Christian, but he is seeking hard after God. And God is clearly on his case. He just doesn't know Jesus yet. He knows that there's something more to life than what he was raised to believe. And when he looks at the people of God, he knows that they know something and they know someone that he doesn't yet know. And so perhaps you are here today and you're a little bit like Cornelius. Perhaps you wouldn't yet call yourself a Christian, but you look into the church and you see something that intrigues you. And you hear Christians talk about and sing about this God that they know and you know there's something more at play than what you were originally led to believe. Perhaps you're even like Cornelius, starting to join in on what the people of God are doing. Well, I just want to say God is clearly on your case, actually. God is clearly on your case. He's drawing you. And as Adrian started us off with this morning, there are no coincidences in God. He is in control of what is happening, and he's drawing you to himself. And to be honest, even the fact that you are here today, that you find yourself here today, is evidence of the fact that God, God is on your case. The second thing to notice is this, that Cornelius gives to the poor. He's generous and kind to the poor, which is not a major feature of the story, but what we see is that in, in all throughout Scripture, we see that God cares deeply. He cares deeply about people, and particularly those who are in need. He cares deeply about the poor. And so he's thrilled when, the people, when people are reaching out to bless those who are in need around him. There's this verse in Proverbs which says this. It says that uh, whoever is generous to the poor, whoever is kind to the poor, whoever is lends to the poor, it's, it's like they are lending to God and God will repay them for what they have done. I'm not going to go into that in depth, but like, that is incredible. Just let that sit with you. Whoever gives to the poor lends to the Lord and God will repay them for what he's done. So if you are going to have anybody 
in the world indebted to you, the owner of all things and the Lord over all creation. Having him in your debt is a pretty good place to be. God loves it when we care for the poor, when we reach out to the poor, when we bless those who are in need around us, whether that be in word or deed. Scene 2 opens, in, uh, and from verse 9 it says this, About noon the following day, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry, he wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat going to press the pause button again, see some things that we notice. Already we've seen that we encounter God in the place of prayer, that actually both Cornelius and Peter were both praying when God appeared to them in, their, uh, in these visions. You know, prayer is such a privilege. It's such a privilege. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I often take prayer for granted. It is such a privilege to be able to talk to the creator of the universe who knows the detail of your life and cares about it as well. Prayer is such a privilege. So if you're wanting to encounter God more, then my question to you is how committed are you to prayer? Second thing we notice is this, that the discipline of prayer is good, but so is taking any opportunity that you have to pray. So Cornelius was probably at the temple courts at three in the afternoon. That's probably what he was doing, joining in with the Jewish people on their prayer. He was uh, in the discipline of prayer, doing uh, it at an allotted time, something he had planned and prepared. However, Peter was just killing some time because lunch was being prepared. He was just taking the opportunity to pray when he found himself with some opportunity. Uh, I read a tweet recently by a guy called Smith Wigglesworth uh, which in itself is weird because he died 70 years ago. So I don't know what he's doing uh, tweeting. But the, twi- the tweet said something like this. He said, I rarely spend longer than 30 minutes praying, but I never go longer than 30 minutes without praying. He's in constant communion with God, constantly talking to God, taking any opportunity that he has to pray. So the discipline of prayer is good, but so is just taking any opportunity that you have as well, allowing God to speak into your space. Third thing we notice about prayer is this, that God speaks in ways that we can understand. Peter was hungry, and God gave him a vision about food. You know, God is mysterious, but he's not cryptic. He wants to be understood. And sometimes we have to wrestle with what he's saying to us, but he knows how we're wired. He knows what we're going to respond to. So don't be surprised if you're a surfer and God speaks to you in the surf. Don't be surprised if you're an artist and God speaks to you through art. Don't be surprised if you're a mum and God speaks to you through your kids. Don't be surprised if God speaks to you in those ways because he speaks to us every day and through the every day. He's constantly in contact with us. Are we listening? He speaks to us every day through the every day. Scene 2 continues, uh, verse 13. So, then the voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14, surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. We're going to come back to that. It happened three times. And immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. Verse 17, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped there. Verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, he's wrestling with it, what does it mean? The Spirit said to him, Simon, three men, three men are looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, don't hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. I just want to talk really quickly about providence. Providence has to do with God's sovereignty, his, him being in control of all things. But it also has to do with his kind of farsightedness, the, far, the, the fact that he sees ahead of time and is working intimately in his creation. He is working consistently, he's working constantly, he's working confidently because he sees ahead of time. And what we notice here in this story is a few coincidences. Peter was living at the time with a guy called Simon, and Simon was a tanner. What is a tanner? Uh, A tanner is someone who works with dead animals and animal hides and tans them. Uh, It's not only 
an undesirable place for Peter to be staying because it would have been pretty messy and it would have stunk. But as a Jew, the Old Testament ceremonial law meant that he would have been um, found it really difficult to be in an unclean environment like that. But the fact that he's already staying there means that God is preparing him for what lay ahead. God is already at work in his life and preparing him for a change of mindset. Peter's also hungry when he goes up onto the roof to pray and God speaks to him about food. Peter's vision that he has is the same day that the guys are en route to come and meet him. And when he has it, when he is, while he's wrestling with the meaning of the vision, these three guys then arrive to speak to him. Then God interprets what the vision means for him in that moment. And what we see here is that the vision happened three times and three men also arrive at the doorstep. And you might think, well, that's just coincidence. That's just an accident. But what we know is, as Adrian kicked us off with this morning, there are no coincidences in God. Actually, God is preparing Peter for what he's calling him to do. And when, when you add all these coincidences together, you see that God is at work. God's at work in these guys' lives. And God is at work in our lives as well. You know, it's no coincidence that you find yourself here this morning. You might think that you made the decision to come. You might think that you responded to the invite of a friend. You might think it's because you were walking around the streets of DY and saw the signs outside or you Googled something this week and Grace City popped up in Google. You might think that it was something else that brought you here, but actually you're here because God providentially is in control of all things, saw ahead of time and wanted you to be here this morning. There is no coincidences in God. Verse 20, so get up, that's Peter, and go downstairs Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? Then Cornelius' men explain about Cornelius' vision, and Peter agrees to let them stay, and we'll go with them the next day. That's the end of scene two. Then scene three opens, uh, verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. So Peter took a team of people with him. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea, and Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends to come and hear, and what, hear what Peter has to say. Uh, this is an amazing evangelistic opportunity. Right? Peter loves Jesus. He loves talking about Jesus. And he's been invited into a house where there's a whole bunch of people eager to hear about Jesus. Like Peter, he's probably beside himself at this point. And he starts off in verse 28 by saying, you're well aware that it's against our law, the Jewish ceremonial law, for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. What we see is that not only is God providentially in control of Cornelius' life, drawing Cornelius to himself, but God's also working in Peter's life as well, preparing him for what lay ahead. God's preparing Peter to reach out into a group of people he never thought he would reach out into. God is preparing Peter to do something that he never thought that he would do. Verse 29, so when I was sent for, Peter says, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius then explains to Peter about the vision and says in verse 33, so I sent for you immediately. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. If you remember back to the start of the passage, Cornelius was devout. He was God-fearing. He gave generously to those who were in need, and he even prayed. Why was it that Cornelius also needed to hear everything that Peter had to say as well? Cornelius already looks like a pretty good guy. Right? He's got his life in order, seemingly. I just want to say that belief in a divine creator is a good start. That is a good start, but there's more to the picture than that. James, in the letter that he wrote to the churches, says this, You believe that there's one God, good, even the demons believe that. So it's not just believing in a divine creator that is the end of the story. Cornelius knows that there's more. And so he's humbly seeking that more. And he says, hey, Peter, I'm here to listen to everything that you've got to say. He knows that Peter has something and knows something that he doesn't. And this is the kind of heart that God loves. He loves 
the kind of heart that does good to those who are in need, but also knows that that doing good isn't enough to earn you favor with a perfect God. But the good news is that Jesus came and Jesus is enough. So even though Cornelius' good deeds aren't enough, Jesus is, and that's what Peter begins to unpack for him and for the group of people around. Verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Why is the gospel good news of peace? It's good news of peace because what Jesus did enabled peace between man and God, and it also enabled peace between man and man as well. It enabled peace between every nation and every tribe and every tongue. Where there once was disunity and enmity and strife, the gospel brings unity and brings peace as well. It brings peace between different nations and tribes and tongues and colors. It brings peace between Northern Beaches people and Western Suburbs people. It brings peace between English speakers and non-English speakers. It brings peace between the university educated and those who aren't qualified. It brings peace between the single and the married, the rich and the poor. The gospel, the good news is a good news of peace and it brings peace between all people, between God and man and between all of mankind as well. Verse 37 You know what has happened throughout the providence of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Verse 39, we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him, that's Jesus, by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. Verse 42, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone, everyone, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone. This is good news of peace For everyone, for slave and free and Jew and Gentile and rich and poor. This is good news of peace for everyone who believes. It's no longer an exclusive thing. This Jesus thing is going global now. It's going to the ends of the earth and it made its way all the way to us here in DY in Sydney. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. They were astonished that the gifts of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So what's happening? Peter is speaking and faith is beginning to rise in the people who are hearing. And they're beginning to respond in repentance. And then God comes on them, supernaturally touches them. And how are they going to respond? They respond by getting baptized. And Peter said, verse 47, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Close of scene three. They belonged already to a community. They believed in Jesus. They'd even received the Holy Spirit, but they still got baptized. Why was it important that they got baptized? Well, it's timely, actually, a timely reminder, because as you heard from Anna, we're actually running a baptism info session after this meeting because we want to baptize believers next uh, Sunday on the 5th. So if you're a Christian here today and you've not been baptized as a believer, then I want to encourage you. We'd love to chat, just have a relaxed chat and let you ask questions about what that is about. But just to cover very quickly why the big deal about baptism, let me tell you three things baptism does not do. Baptism doesn't save you. Jesus does that. Baptism doesn't get you into heaven. Jesus does that. Baptism, getting baptized doesn't even mean that God loves you more than he did before because his love is unconditional. He can't love you more than he does and he won't love you less. So what is the big deal about getting baptized? Well, Jesus did it. 
and Jesus commands us to do it. And as Christians, we are followers of him, followers of his example, and we do what he calls us to do. So if you're a Christian here today and you've not been baptized, plug for the info session after this meeting. But here are a couple of other ways uh, that we can apply to what God, uh, we can apply what God's saying in this story. The first thing I think is this, that Jesus' offer of salvation, his offer of forgiveness of sins is for everyone. Right? He's not angry. He's not vindictive. Actually, God is kind and he's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but that we should all come to repentance and receive his gift of eternal life. But believing in him as a divine creator alone, believing in him as a force or some ethereal, unknowable being, that's not the full picture. Actually, God is a person. He's a person with a name, and his name is Jesus, and he knows the detail of your life, and he knows you intimately. He wants you to get to know him. He wants relationship with you. So if you're here today and... You're not sure whether you're a Christian, or maybe you're here today and you're sure you're not a Christian, but you're just looking in to see what this thing is all about. I just want to remind you, you're here today because God ordained it. Actually, it's no accident that you're here. It's no coincidence that you're here. God's at work in your life. He's drawing you to himself. Maybe you think, think you were here because you're invited by a friend, or you saw a sign, or you found us on the net. The truth is, you're here because God's drawing you and because he wants relationship with you. So the question is, how are you going to respond to that reality? If you let him, like the people here in this story, God will pour his spirit out on you and you'll come into a knowledge of this joy and this hope and this peace and this love that Christians experience in this life, in part, but will experience an even greater measure in the life to come as well. And finally, if you are a Christian here today, and you'd forgive me a little speculation at this point, I want to ask you, how do you imagine that the Gentile centurion might have developed this devout, God-fearing, generous, and prayerful lifestyle? How do you think he would have developed that kind of lifestyle? Well, when we read through this passage about the centurion. Did anybody think of the centurion from Luke 7 that Jesus met? So there was this guy who, um, he was a centurion, he had some servants, one of them got sick, he cared about his servants, and he sent somebody to go fetch Jesus so that Jesus would come and pray for this guy who was sick, and he ended up getting healed. And then Jesus and this guy have a conversation about uh, knowing what it's like to be in and under authority. Do you remember that guy from Luke 7? So, so is there any connection maybe between that centurion in Luke 7 and the centurion Cornelius that we meet here in Luke 10? Like there are some remarkable similarities between these two guys. They're both centurions, as I mentioned. They're both Gentiles. They're not part of the people of God. But they're incredibly sympathetic to the Jewish plight. They're incredibly involved, actually, in the Jewish community. The Luke 7 centurion actually helps build the temple. They respect their traditions. They're incredibly kind to the underclass, to those who are poor and in need. They're both God-fearing, the text tells us. So when I, when I kind of realized these similarities between these two, it, it made me ask the question, is there any connection? And for me, there are three possible options. One is that they're the same person. Well, that's a possibility. Maybe they're the same person. I think that's probably unlikely, though. I think it's probably unlikely because... Some time has passed between these two stories, but also because Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, and he didn't say they were the same person. So I think that's probably unlikely. Another option might mean that they didn't know each other at all, and that's a possibility, but I think that's probably unlikely too, because they moved in really similar circles. They were both centurions in the Roman army. And they also both demonstrated such similar attitudes. As I just said, they were both devout, God-fearing, prayerful, kind to the underclass, and involved in Jewish community. And part of the mandate for the Roman army at the time was to oppress the Jewish people. So the fact that both of these centurions demonstrated that kind of attitude 
means that I think they probably knew each other and probably had had influence on each other. And that's the third option. Maybe they knew each other. And this is only speculation, right? But perhaps they knew each other. And perhaps what had happened was that the Luke 7 centurion who met Jesus and encountered his healing touch and saw his power on display was so influenced by what he experienced that he shared his faith with everybody in his sphere of influence, which included this guy we met today in Acts 10, Cornelius. Maybe he shared his faith because he was so impacted by what he had experienced of Jesus that this Acts 10 guy ended up encountering Jesus too. And not only did it change the trajectory of Cornelius' eternity, but it changed the trajectory of his entire family, his entire household's eternity, and it meant that the gospel ended up going into the Gentile world, and we are partly recipients of that. Perhaps that's what happened. So here's a question for you. Who has God placed within our sphere of influence? Who's God placed within our sphere of influence? I was privileged to be at Anne Callaghan's uh, memorial service on Friday, uh, and we miss her desperately, but I was so challenged and encouraged by hundreds, if not thousands of people who were within her sphere of influence who she impacted. Because she lived a life that was God-glorifying, she lived a life that was on mission with him, and she impacted literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people because of a life that she lived on mission with God. Who has God put within our sphere of influence? Is there somebody that he has particularly gifted you, positioned you, and called you to reach out to and positively impact? And it might be just as simple as us taking a meal to a new neighbor that moves in or offering a babysit for a family that lives in our block that doesn't seem to have any family around. Or it might be praying for someone who we know needs prayer and they're at the end of themselves because they've tried everything else. It might be sharing our faith with somebody who is in that sphere of influence as well. Last year, I uh, joined a local surf club because I wanted to be, I just moved into the area and I wanted to be a part of the community and hopefully a blessing uh, to it. So I patrolled last season and I had my first patrol uh, this season about six weeks ago. And so um, you know, I'm one of the guys in the yellow and the red um, that you see down at the beach. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's me there with my girls. Uh, so I patrolled for the first time about six weeks ago, and I've got to be honest, I got to the end of that patrol, and I was pretty disappointed. It was the first time for the season that I'd been down there, but uh, I, I, you know, I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere with anyone. I felt like I had been trying to have conversations of consequence, but I wasn't getting anywhere. I felt like nobody really knew me down there, actually. And I even felt like I wasn't getting to do any of those, you know, David Hasselhoff, dive off the side of the boat kind of things very often either because most of the people who come to our beach are locals and can swim. So I was thinking, what's the point of this? Why am I doing this? I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere or like anybody knows me. And I was ready to pack it in and just say, you know what? I'm short on time anyway. I might as well have spend some more time with my family or resting or something like that. I was ready to uh, pack it in. But then last Saturday, uh, I patrolled again, and actually, it was dramatically different last Saturday. Last Saturday, I had a couple of conversations which were really faith-focused and uh, really positive. And, uh, you know, there's a girl who, that I spoke to who's probably going to come down and volunteer at the food care shop because she cares about the community as well. And although she's not a Christian, she wants to be involved in some good that's happening in the community. Not only that, but Heather snapped that photo uh, of us when she popped down at lunchtime to bring me some lunch. And that photo by the Tuesday, by Tuesday this week, had not only made its way all the way around our local club of South Narrabeen, it had actually made its way to Surf Life Saving New South Wales and it had become their profile pick for the week. So I've gone from like being in obscurity and nobody knowing me one week to now everybody knowing me and knowing my family as well in a community that I'm trying to reach out to. And I didn't do any of that actually because God's at work. God's at work under the surface even when we're lacking faith. He's providentially connecting people and aligning circumstances so that those who are willing to take the good news into a community can be effective for his glory. 
You know, I'd forgotten that blessing a community takes time and it takes consistency and it takes a genuine heart to be there for the good of the city. I'd forgotten those things and I was ready to give up. So if you wouldn't mind, could you stand with me? I just want to pray as we wrap up. I just want to pray for all of us, actually. God, I want to thank you that we can rest in the fact that you are in control of all things, that you are providentially working to align circumstances, that you're, Lord, connecting people and connecting us with unreached people that we're unaware of even at this point. Lord, I want to thank you that the privilege of getting a partner in your mission has far greater impact than we might ever know actually in this life. But Lord, as the people of God, we want to respond to the fact that you've put us in a particular place to have a positive impact on a particular sphere that we can influence. So Lord, we want to be obedient to your call. We're sorry for the times that we lack faith and feel we're getting nowhere. Lord, we're sorry for the times where we're lacking any activity at all. But Lord, we rest in the fact that you're at work even when we're not. Lord, we rest in the fact that you're in control and preparing hearts to receive the good news of Jesus. And so, Lord, we just want to say we want to be obedient to you. Can you please, Lord, encourage us, embolden us, come by your Holy Spirit on us to give us everything that we need, every tool that we need, and every encouragement that we need to be a blessing into this city. Lord, we know that you're at work shaping us. Would you please use us to bring shape to the city? And Lord, for those who don't know you here today, Lord, I pray you would continue to be at work in their hearts. I pray that they would recognize the fact that they're not here by accident, they're not connected to this community by accident, but that you are at work in their lives, drawing them to yourselves. Lord, I pray you would remind them that you are the best friend that they will ever know. And Lord, that you are only here for our good and not our harm. And that life with you is fuller than life without you. And that you are faithful to fulfill every promise, especially the promise of eternal life with you where everything is good and nothing is bad. So we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the uniqueness of his message. The fact that he brought the good news of peace and the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, I pray that people would reach out and receive your hand of forgiveness this morning. I pray you would stir up faith within them to respond to your offer, the free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.